All right, guys, this is today we are going to be talking on a salmon topic that I call, what are you waiting for? And we are going to be looking at taking a very close look uh, by the, uh, at the man by the pool of Bethesda, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, incidentally. Because this thing, this passage illustrates a lot about what is happening to us as uh, as individuals. Okay, this sermon is for everybody, whatever you believe. So you want to just pay attention and let the Holy Spirit minister to you today. Don't block your mind and say, "No, I'm not a Christian yet, sir." No, this is about life, and I'm going to use it to teach about life. Because every word that Jesus himself spoke, as you can see, I read a passage concerning Jesus. I'm all about that. What Jesus himself said, I'm not into doctrines, I'm into what Jesus asked us to do. So I'm going to be making some observations. See, this is what is happening here. There is this pool at that time in Jerusalem uh, that is uh, that um, uh, is reported to form at a certain point of the time. or the, Nobody knows the time is going to happen. It comes infrequently. And when the, when the water starts overflowing, apparently those who are able to get into the pool, they get healed. For some reason, that the, the, the water has some kind of um, a curative properties, at least in those days, for those who are living in the Jerusalem of that time. So everybody gathers around this water. Okay? They gather. And again, you are going to excuse me. I deliberately speak in colloquial terms. I don't like talking pastor speak. Okay? I Because on the streets, people want you to speak the way they can understand. So for those of you who are religious out there, who might be wondering what kind of pastor is this? Buckle your seatbelt because it's only going to get worse before it gets better, as you understand me. All right. So these guys, they will gather, everybody will gather there, they see, they gather in the, around the water. Immediately they start for me, everybody jumps in. Now, this guy that Jesus met at this pool on this day that we're going to be discussing, okay, Jesus got in there and saw this man who's been an invalid for 38 years standing by that pool. And then they had a conversation. So that conversation, I'm going to use it to make about 10 observations. And my prayer today is that as I make those observations, you will see yourself in this thing that I'm going to be talking about. I am very big on contact sermons. I don't believe in, in teaching theoretical sermons that you cannot use on Monday morning. Anytime you hear me speak, better be sure I'm going to be talking in a way that can reach you where you can use whatever I say, if it makes sense to you, on Monday morning, on Tuesday morning, in your daily life, in your marriage, in your career. That to me is what that is practical sermons for daily living. That's what I believe in. I'm not so much into theory and doctrine that we can argue from now to tomorrow. So you're going to forgive me if I just go straight to the point. We're going to talk. I'm going to make some observations here. All right. They say, like I said, verse 2 says that, in this place that lay a multitude of sick people. Everybody trying to get well. Everybody trying to wait for that pool, for that uh, uh, that water to form and for it to come out. So here's my first observation here, guys. Now, if you read that first verse, it says, they are in Jerusalem. And for all of us, even if you are an unbeliever, at least you know, in those days, Jerusalem is supposed to be a place of peace. In fact, that's what it means. It's a place of peace. On Mount Zion, there shall be peace, right? But here we have multitudes of people who are not at peace. You can't be at peace if you are blind. You can't, you can't be living a peaceful life if you are an invalid, if you can't go anywhere you want to go. I'm talking about in terms of uh, living the life that Christ or that God, your creator, wants you to live. So we see an oxymoron here. We see a contradiction in terms. We see something that is not really, not really, um, uh, not really together here. People are supposedly in a place of peace, but yet they do not have peace. Jerusalem is a place of blessing, but there are people who are not blessed. Jerusalem is a place of healing and deliverance, but there are people lying around in bondage. Does that remind you of our churches today? Does that remind you of places that we call sanctuary? There are many people. The name of the pool is called Bethesda, and it translates to house of mercy. Yet, here we see people who have not received mercy, but are rather sick, blind, and lame. This is the situation many of us have proclaimed. This is the situation most of us, or many of us, who have proclaimed 
our faith in Jesus are dealing with. Many will not admit it, but that's what we are dealing with. We have been called to be kings. But many of us insist on sitting by our inheritance and starve to death without making any move to possess our possession. We are in a place of mercy and deliverance. But many of us still feel bound by our circumstances, by our environment. Just like these guys, they were in Jerusalem. That's supposed to be a place of peace, a place of progress, a place where God lives. But look at them. They are sick. They say sick multitude. Though the Bible has showed us that those who have been set free by Jesus are free indeed. Many of us are still living blind, lame, and paralyzed lives. And I'm not just talking physically now. We have been lame in terms of being stuck in one place for a long time and paralyzed from doing anything about our pitiful condition. Many of us cannot even afford to find the money to send our kids to school. Though we supposedly live in a place of mercy, many of us go to church four or five times a week. Many of us read our Bible every day. Many of us believe. And yet, we are still dealing with this. This is the situation we find ourselves in our different lives, in our different, in our different uh, our works. Now, something just like many of us, this is what these guys do. The next thing they do is they say they were waiting for the moving of the water. Isn't that strange? That's verse 3. And for you, if you have your Bible in John, we are, in, we are reading John chapter 5. This is verse 3 of it. It says, In there lay a great multitude of sick people who are blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. They were waiting for, the, for something to happen. And that exactly is the condition of many of us today. That's why I, I titled this sermon, What Are You Waiting For? The condition of many of us today is that we are waiting for something. There are many of us who go to church, but we are waiting for some great emotion to engulf us so that we can be sure that we are in the presence of God. There are those of us who have not given their lives to Christ. If you are out there, I'm talking about you. And we are just waiting for some great emotional movement in your lives that will show that God is calling you. As if uh, emotion is synonymous with the presence of the Holy Spirit. That is one of the big confessions in the body of Christ. There are those of us who are waiting, who have their eyes on a business they want to start, but are waiting for something to happen so that they can get rich quick. Again, like I said, this, my teaching today is, applies to every one of us, whether you believe in Christ or you believe in Buddha or whatever it is you believe in. God is speaking to you. Maybe you have your, a business idea. You have something in your mind that God has given you an idea of what to do. You have this great vision, but you are waiting. You are waiting for something to happen so that you can become rich quick without doing anything. There are those of us who are waiting for something that has happened to an individual. They know to happen to them also. Basically, remember what we do in church? We claim the blessing of somebody else. Oh, God, I did it for this brother. Do it for me. We are waiting for what happened to brother A to also happen to us because we believe our God is a God that shares this thing equally. But the question you have to ask yourself today is what are you waiting for? Who are you waiting for? You need to remember something. Waiting around will not solve the problem. The man by that pool has been waiting for 38 years because he was waiting for something. He was waiting for somebody to help him. He was waiting for something to happen. He's been there for 38 years, proved that waiting around is not going to solve the problem for you. Go with me. I'm, I am, I'm, I am, I'm going somewhere this morning. Just open your mind and flow with me. My uh, number three observation here. Say, the man had an infirmity for 38 years. Then Jesus showed up. Just like I believe Jesus is going to show up in the life of every one of you watching this today. And then Jesus asked him a question. I mean, if Jesus were to be to go to Bible school today, they will fail him. Somebody is by the pool. Somebody is invalid. He's on a wheelchair or lying down. Obviously cannot walk. And then you come in as a pastor. You are saying, do you want to be do you want to get well? I mean, what kind of question is that, people? A man is obviously sick. Okay? A, the man is obviously sick, but Jesus T asked. A very, very, very <coughs> intriguing question. I mean, it's like seeing a man <laughs> that is blind, just like he has blind Bartimaeus. 
Do you want to be made well? There's a reason Jesus has this case. Because it's not, it's, I mean, take the case of blind Bartimaeus. He has a guy that is blind, obviously, sh shouting, Master, heal me, son of David, heal my eyes. And when Jesus called him, you know what Jesus asked him? He said, do you want to see? I mean, that sounds like a stupid question if you are looking at it from a, a temporal point of view. But there's a reason why Jesus asked that. Just like he asked this man, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? At first glance, Jesus' question sounds funny. I mean, why is he asking a lame man whether he wants to be well? After all, you will tell yourself, he could see his pitiful condition. He could see he had camped with that, in, by that water that could heal him. But I believe, see, because Jesus is not stupid and he's not going to be asking stupid questions. So I believe that Jesus asked the question because he was surprised to see the man there. You have to think about this. Jesus knew the man had no business waiting for any movement of water, as you're going to see later in this, in this uh, uh, conversation he had with him. Jesus knew this man had no business being in that water because he had the potential to do whatever he wanted. But instead, he was waiting. So Jesus is asking, do you want to be well? Because Jesus was surprised that the man could be lying there waiting for something magical to happen to him when he could make the move for himself. Jesus was surprised that the man could be waiting around and expect something to happen to him. That's why I asked him the question. I mean, I'm thinking now, I don't know the mind of Jesus, but this guy it appeared to me, okay? I mean, he sees a man that obviously needs help, but he's asking, do you need help or do you really want to be well? So Jesus is asking you the same question today. Do you really want to get out of poverty? Because I see so many Christians. Let me talk to Christians first who are jobless, who are poor. You know, we, we, we console ourselves with this, and one day we are going to come back and we are going to argue that oxymoron. You know, we uh, uh, Christians love this saying. They will quote David, I've been young, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children beg for bread. I don't know what David saw when he said that, but I certainly have seen a lot of righteous people that are begging for bread. Okay, again, we are going to get into all this controversy later. But today, let's focus here, okay? Because when you say you have not seen righteous bread for a you must be closing your eyes. Because after every service I go to, I always have one or two people that will come that don't even have money to go home from that service. I have Christians, Bible-believing, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, who are basically dying of poverty. So I don't know how I'm going to reconcile that with what David said, but the day we discuss that, we will talk about it because... I don't want you to be a parrot Christian. As you are quoting the Bible, you got to try to apply it. You got to say, okay, how does this apply to me? How does this, is this relevant to me? Okay? So, now, now as you ask comment, as you have comment as I'm preaching, please feel free. I'll probably put some of your comments up there. For me, uh, someone should not be me just telling you. We can have a discussion. So, I believe that Jesus was wondering, okay, just now about you. Jesus is asking you, do you really want to be out of poverty? Do you really want to get a better job? Do you really want to control your environment? He's asking because he knows that many of us have not really considered the question in the light of our potential. We prefer to go to anointing service than to consider this question in the light of our potential, what we can do. Jesus is wondering, why are we still waiting for him to solve our problems when he already solved it 2,000 years ago? We say this, we say Jesus, we quote it all the time, that Jesus on the cross say he has, it is finished. And we interpret that to mean he has finished the work. So then why, is he, why are you still waiting around? Jesus already proclaimed freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed. And he also proclaimed the year of the Lord's favor in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He was clear about that. When he went to the, to the, to the synagogue and they gave him the scripture to read, he said, this scripture it is fulfilled in your midst right now, 2,000 years ago. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Go read it again. So Jesus is wondering, what are we waiting for? For those of you who are camping out in churches, waiting for God to do a miracle. Those of you who want to go, who want to keep going to anointing service, night vigils, waiting for the move of God, is asking you, what are you waiting for? Jesus' mission was to deliver us and to empower us to dominate our environment and our heartless situations. 
and he has accomplished this. And we killed him for it. Anyway, on the cross, he finished the work. So he does not even understand why we are still waiting around. So Jesus is telling somebody today that we need not sit by the pool of despair. You don't need to sit by the pool of unemployment. You don't need to sit by the pool of poverty. When you have all the potential to overcome in you all the time, if you have the Holy Spirit, you've got the potential to overcome. So it's asking, do you want to get it? Well, this is the question I believe Jesus is asking you today because the way you are running your life now, right now, it doesn't seem like you are ready to get out of poverty. Because if you are ready to get out of poverty, you will not be camping out at Holy Ghost night or um, um, uh, anointing night or prayer night or whatever night is out there. You are going to be internalizing the word of God to begin to take the actions you can take. No, I say this because I see too many Christians. Now, I'm not saying don't go to anointing service or Holy Ghost services. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you need to understand that you can't keep waiting because you have the potential inside of you. I remember a long time ago when one of my books came out, I was uh, invited by one of the uh, big pastors in Nigeria to come and um, uh, teach and promote the book somewhere in Idimu. It's a, a big, I mean, I'm talking about 7 a.m. in the morning. There are thousands of people waiting for the anointing service. I preached at that service. It was glorious. I saw people move. I saw the man of God do his thing, pray, anoint people and all that. That was, I think, Tuesday or so or Monday. I can't remember. It wasn't a Sunday, though. It was a, an anointing service somewhere in Idimu, somewhere in Lagos. Then two days later, I was at another big church in Fester, um, um, organized by one of my uh, spiritual fathers in the um, redeemed camp at that time. You know, and I was shocked. After that service, an anointing service organized by the same man for that church, okay? He did his thing, heavily anointed man of God, granted. After the service, I was shocked that many people who were at the service two days before, the anointing service in the 7 a.m. two days before, came to meet me. They were telling me, oh, they saw me at the anointing service two days ago. This again, I think it was a Wednesday morning, like 10 a.m. in the morning. Young people. And they said they saw me, they love my book, they would like to get a copy of it. And we, then it occurred to me, then I had to ask them. So you don't have a job? They say yes. So you are looking to get a job. So what business do you have going to anointing service on Monday morning from 7 to 10 a.m. and then coming to another one on Wednesday, 10 to 12 noon? What is your problem? What are you waiting for? You already got a prayer. Somebody already anointed you. Then you need to go out there to go look for the job. See, see how we deceive ourselves in Christianity? We believe as many anointing services as we go is when God is going to answer. You deceive yourself. That's why you are still where you are, guys. And I'm going to say it the way it is. After you have prayed, you got to go out there. Christ will not be deceived. A man will reap what he sowed. You can have all the faith in the world. If you don't have works to back it, there's nothing for your faith to work on. That's why Paul said so. Say, so show me your works. Then you show me your faith by your works. You can't tell me you have faith when you have no works backing it up. If you believe in the prayer of that man of God who prayed for you on Monday, that your job is coming, that you're going to get your job and all that prayer, why are you not going on Tuesday morning to go look for that job? Why are you in another anointing service by the same man, incidentally? You're not following him around like uh, groupies. The way people follow um, uh, rock stars. You're following all over his anointing. Some of you are 10, four or five of his anointing services a week. What is your problem? Who has bewitched you? You take prayer. I don't have a problem with prayer. But you can't go to anointing services four times a week and then you are wondering why God has not answered your prayer. You take the anointing you got that first time, then go out there and take it. Because the devil is not going to give you Nobody's going to give you a job because you prayed yesterday. You're going to go out there and demand it, which means you got to look for job opportunities. You got to be where job applications have been submitted. You got to go to where people are getting jobs, not another church service. This is very important. That is why Jesus is asking you today. Do you really want to get well? Do you really want to be rich? Do you really want to get married? I have people who have been praying for to get a husband or wife for a very long time. Okay? But they don't go to where the singles are. 
they go from their house, they go to church, they go to the anointing service, they go to the prayer service where they pray uh, for uh, life partners. From there, they go back to their house. They don't go to where the singles are because they think it's sinful and they are wondering why they are not married. They don't dress up, they don't dress sharp to attract people from the opposite sex. They wonder, oh, when, my, when, when my time is right, God will bring my husband. You lie to yourself. Jesus is really asking you, do you really want a husband? Same way, hey, I'm not saying God doesn't do miracle people. God does it. But you are looking for the fruit of the womb. But you have not, there's a reason why God allows science to develop at the level it has developed. There's a reason why God allowed the internet. So that I can teach you, I can speak to you today, wherever you are. So you're looking for fruit of the womb. But every time, all you are looking for is anointing and is pastors. That's how you all always end up where they start uh, doing some nasty stuff with you. Because they see that you are gullible. Those pastors that abuse Christ, abuse the calling upon their life, they do it to people who are gullible. If you know your God, if you know your word, it is not possible. But when they see you on Monday, you are coming to pray for fruit of the womb. On Thursday, they see you are coming to pray for fruit of the womb. On Sunday, you are coming to pray for fruit of the womb. The next thing they're going to start telling you is that it's your mother-in-law that is your problem. They start creating problems for you where problems are not. And yet, there are fertility clinics out there. There are videos you can watch. There are examinations you should go for to see whether you have a problem or your husband have a problem. That's the reason God allowed science. This, again, I know this is not going to be popular with many of us out there who believe in miracle, miracle, miracle. I'm not saying I don't believe in miracle. But that is not the preference of Jesus. All the miracles Jesus did, maybe with the exception of one, the raising of Lazarus, were disruptive. In other words, he didn't plan it. People came and harassed him or disturbed him where he was doing his thing, and then he took time out to do that miracle. But Jesus never gathered anybody together to say, I want to come and do miracle. Go read it again. Go read your scripture. You got to read this word yourself. Don't let me deceive you. Don't let any other pastor deceive you either. The only way you're going to do that is to know the word for yourself by reading it and asking the Holy Spirit to teach you. See, this is this is this is this is key. You got to read it and then ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. Your pastors are okay. They are men of God to teach you to guide you, but you still have to make that decision. There's no way there where Jesus gathered everybody and said, let's come and do miracle. Because miracle was not his preference. His preference was to teach you the word, to put the word inside of you. Because once you have the word inside of you, you don't even need the miracles. You will get miracles every day. So Jesus asked this guy, do you want to be made well? <laughs> and the guy started talking English. Okay? But before we go to the guy, he talk, I want to note something. My observation number four. On this, on this passage. Note that Jesus singled out one man from among many people. Okay? He singled out from... <laughs> he singled out one man. One man. One man. Jesus did not address the whole congregation and did not heal the whole group. They, we were told that there's a multitude there. Multitude. But Jesus only addressed one person. And that's how it is. Jesus really addresses a crowd together when he wants to ask questions. He always personalizes it. It's a personal question for you today. That question that do you want to be made well? Do you want to be rich? Do you want to be happy? Do you want to be married? Do you want to get a job? Do you want to travel? Whatever it is, it's a personal question. Because too many of us are hiding in a group saying, after all, I'm not the only one in this situation. Or I'm better off than most people. You are comparing yourself to the next guy. And you are here to run your own race. You are not, this is not a group race about who comes first or who comes last. You are running a personal race on this earth. You came alone, you're going to die alone. So, okay, so there is no, no group there. So you can't take your cue from a group. Jesus is asking you, yes, you that you are watching me right now, he's asking you directly, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to get out of unemployment? Do you want to get out of that jam that you put yourself? Do you want to be married? Do you want to have children? It's asking you a personal question. Do you want to be made whole? It's a personal question. And you have to answer him. What is it going to be? Now he's asking. Let's look at the answer that most give. Okay? Just like this guy. 
The man said, <coughs> excuse me. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. First, let me put some stuff. Comment first. Let me see what, uh, what you guys are saying. I need you guys to, uh, to be commenting on this, guys. Let's see where you are. Okay. I see a dummy. I want this summons to be interactive. I don't want to be preaching down on you. Let's have a discussion as we are teaching the word. That's what the cyber embassy is all about, where we can have a, a discussion about this word. Somebody does not come and claim he knows everything. Let's have a discussion. All right. Uh, yes, uh, I think that's one of our staff right there. Uh, okay. He said, let's, let's get around. Exactly. Alex, that's what most people say. Let's get around the water. And then they get there and they are looking. But let's hear the man. Let's hear what he has to say. Okay. When Jesus asked him a question, this is his answer. He said, um, no, oh, okay. I think I already showed that. Uh, the observation number five here. Okay. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to help me to the pool <laughs> when the water, instead of, I mean, he's got to say something because when Jesus asked him, What are you doing here? Why are you still here? And that answer illustrates the problem of many of us today. Many of us are living below our potential because we are still waiting for people to bail us out. Many are still waiting for our friends or brother who is connected to us to give us a handout. Many are still waiting for other men to hold our hand and lead us forward. When we could do very well ourselves a favor. I used to have a mentor once who would tell me, don't allow people to do for you a favor that you can do for yourself. But that's what many of us do. We complain. <laughs> the man said, while I'm coming, other people will step in front of me. This guy is ready to blame other people for his inability to get into the water. He's ready to blame other people's activities for his own mediocrity. He's ready to divert the attention from his own laziness by focusing on the aggression of other people. I mean, the man has been there 38 years. You would think by now he will be at the very edge of the water. That even as the water forms, the water will even take him in. I mean, if he can't walk, he has nobody to help him. Don't you think he will have crawled to the very edge where really his body is very close to that water, if not in the water itself by the edge? So that as water overflows, the water will overflow him. No, he won't do that. He would rather blame other people. Just like you and I. Too many of us are not doing well because we are just too ready to blame other people for our lack of progress. And that's just the truth. I see that all over the U.S. here, and I just shake my head. Everybody is ready to blame somebody else for their problem. Trump is the number one guy. Everybody wants to blame now. Every problem that anybody you see, or they say is Trump's problem, is Trump's fault. It's just too easy and convenient to blame other people for our problems because it, it shields us from responsibility. We blame those who did not work with us. We blame those who did not call us and come to pick us up, even for prayers and job appointments. I've seen this. Where somebody's actually complaining, ah, this sister did not come, he's a wicked person. He knows I don't have a job, uh, a car to get to the church, but they won't come and pick me. Now it's their fault because they didn't come and pick you. You can't find your way. We blame people who didn't come to pick us to take us to job appointments. We blame people who did not borrow us money. Oh, I know he's very rich, and I asked him to give me, borrow me only $500, and he won't even borrow me. That's why I'm in this situation. We blame everybody but our own laziness and lack of discipline. Because the truth of the matter is, there are exceptions, I get it, but more than 95% of us, whatever situation we are in right now, we put ourselves there. With the exception of very, very few. The overwhelming majority. Wherever we find ourselves today is mostly due to our lack of discipline or decisions that we took. Because, like the Bible says, the book of Galatians, a man will reap exactly what he sowed. So we blame other people. But the question you should ask as you are watching this right now, whether you are watching me live or you are watching a recorded version of this, who are you blaming today? What is your excuse to Jesus this morning when he asks you whether you really want to be well like that man because he's asking you? Like I said before, it's a personal question. What is your excuse to Jesus this morning? What is the reason you are giving yourself for your lack of progress with God, with your life, or with your business? You need to be, the year is coming to an end, right? 
So you need to be asking yourself, who did you blame for the for the this 2019 for not going the way you had you hoped on January 1st? Do you blame your family? Do you blame your mother-in-law? That's a favorite uh, uh, person for us to blame. Do you blame your boss? Do you blame the, the city you live in? Do you blame your country? That's a very big pastime in Nigeria now. Everybody wants to blame the government of Buhari for, for their problems. I'm not saying that government is doing well. I'm one of those, I'm one of the big critics of that government. And we're going to do a lot of lot of social action in this church. I'm saying right now, we're not going to separate church and states at Cyber Embassy of Christ. We are going to be militants. We are going to be socially conscious. A lot of us blame our government in Nigeria, but really, what about you? Why are you not focusing on yourself? Or do you blame your pastor? Many of us, that's another uh, 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 favorite uh, 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 scapegoat for many of us. We blame our pastors who ask us to give all our money. That's why we don't have any. Or we blame our pastor who didn't pray for us. Or we blame our pastor who didn't lead you right. As if your pastor is the one you're going to tell when Jesus, when you come face to face with Christ. Do you blame your government? Who are you blaming today? Because until you stop the blame game, you're not going anywhere. I remember, uh, I, I mean, like I always say, this thing, this thing, I try to personalize this sermon so that it's not like we're not talking theory. I have a brother who many of you know me. Yes, like Eric said, yes, we blame everybody but ourselves. See, I have a brother who is doing very well. He's one of the big directors in one of the oil companies in Nigeria. And uh, I'm an attorney. I have this, my law firm then in Nigeria. And I was blaming him that why has my law firm not exploded? Because that's a man that sees over billions of dollars in terms of uh, operations. In fact, he was a financial director. He's still the financial, uh, the financial controller of the maybe the second biggest oil company in the world, at least in Nigeria. And I was expecting him to call me and give me this big, big uh, or maybe oil spillage uh, contract where my law firm can go and represent one community for oil spillage and we get millions of dollars in a, in a, in legal fees. For a few years, I was blaming this guy for why I was not doing as well as I should be doing. That why am I not a millionaire in dollars when I have a brother who is uh, the, the, a, top, a top director in another company? And then some of my other brothers and sisters also joined me complaining about this guy. We seem, we just forgot that he doesn't owe us that. Their, their company have rules. They cannot favor a, a family. And the man is a pastor himself. He said he's not going to go beyond that. He's not going to violate the rules for nobody. And we resented him for trying to do the right thing. He's amazing. I'm telling you the truth about me so that you know I'm not just talking down on you. We all fall into that trap. For years, me and a, a couple of my siblings, we would derive this guy privately. We would say, well, he's just big. He doesn't want to help anybody. That we should forget him. God will help us. Blah, blah, blah. Forget him that he doesn't owe us our responsibility. That we are not big the way we should be big because we are not doing what we should be doing. I mean, by, by the grace of God, I'm one of the more accomplished lawyers out there. I was the first in my master's class. Okay, and I graduated in the top 10 in my first degree. I have an honorary PhD in law. I have done, I have done, I've got all the education. So whatever it is I wanted to achieve in law, I could achieve it by myself. I don't need help from my brother. But for as long as I was blaming him, I was not moving forward with myself. So some of you out there, you are blaming that your brother, who is in a position, uh, 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 who is in a position of um, authority, who is who is not helping you, or maybe it's your father or mother, and then you are living an un unfulfilled life because you are waiting for human beings to come and bail you out. You are waiting for your government. You are waiting for Donald Trump. You are waiting for Hillary Clinton. You are waiting for Buhari to come and solve your problem. And Jesus is asking, what are you waiting for? Do you really want to be well? Because it doesn't look to him <laughs> like, like you want to be well. But let me take some comments here before we get to my next comment. Like I said, this is supposed to be an interactive thing there. We have a mark uh, from, from Idaho. So there's a connection between agency and responsibility. And if we do not accept responsibility for our actions, then we give up the agency that God desires to have and righteously use the Lord. Bless you, really good match. You hit it on the money. Okay, there's a connection between agency and responsibility. When they make you an agent, 
when you become an ambassador of Christ, of yourself, if you say, okay, I don't believe in Christ yet. Okay, I'm still talking about you. Okay, you cannot be responsible for something. You cannot be an agent and then not have responsibility. You have to accept responsibility for your actions. And if you don't do that, you give up your rights. Yes, you can't represent somebody when you don't take responsibility. Thank you so much for that, uh, um, uh, Matt from Idaho. I appreciate that. All right. Um, Eric Philip said we blame, <laughs> we blame everyone but ourselves. Exactly. And that has been going on for too long in the body of Christ, among um, uh, people generally, um, even those who are not Christians, you need to understand that Christ is talking to you today, whether you accept him or not. Do you really want to be well? Do you really, 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 really want to be well or you just want to keep blaming that guy? Now let's go to the next dramatic thing that happened here. As the man was busy doing his uh, blame game and um, um, uh, doing his stuff, doing all this talk, nobody can help me before I get these people are still aggressive. They are Nigerians, they are too aggressive. Before I get there, they've already rushed. These people are Russians. They jump the they jump the gun. They do. They won't even line up to get into the water. They are so unreal. As he was busy giving all that nonsense, <laughs> Jesus just said to him, "Rise, take up your your bed and walk." You see that Jesus is not engaging him to indulge him in his uh, in his foolery. Okay, Jesus just said a simple sentence: "Say, rise, take up your bed and walk." And immediately, the man was made well took up his bed and, and walked. Now, in the context of what we have been going through, this was anticlimactic. Jesus was not empathetic. Jesus did not try to uh, agree with him that, okay, everybody is bad. They are discriminating against you because you are black or because Trump is there. So we know Trump hates everybody from, from Africa. Um, he didn't say, oh, yes, it is true. Buari is this, Buari is that. No, 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 no. He did not engage him. He simply made a pronouncement. And I want you to note something here as I'm about to hit one of the, uh, the high points of this sermon today. Jesus did not pray for him. Jesus did not help him to get into the water, guys. I need you to pay attention. Jesus did not speak in tongues. Jesus did not give him any principles for daily living. Jesus did not give him any money or handouts. Rather, this is what Jesus did. Jesus spoke to the potential in him. He said, pick up your mats, my, my friend, and walk. Jesus spoke to the power that has been lying dormant in the man for years. Jesus spoke to the ability in the man that he did not know he possessed because they said immediately Jesus spoke. The man who thought he was an invalid, the man who thought he could not walk, he picked up his mark and he started walking. Jesus didn't touch him. Jesus spoke to his potential. Jesus made him aware of the awesome ability that he possessed. Jesus simply asked him to pick up his mat by himself. Jesus did not call for people around to help him. Jesus did not pick up the mat for him. He simply told him what he must do to be well. And I hope you are listening right there. You are watching me right now. Jesus gave him the recipe. To be well. He told him what he must do to be well. And the man picked up his mat and walked. See, in a in a an anticlimactic fashion, this miracle was actually done by the man himself taking action. It is amazing the feats that man can achieve if we applied the great mind and great resources that God has blessed us with. Now, I am not saying there are no miracles. You need to listen to me today. I'm about to get a bit controversial right now. Okay? Too many of us in the body of Christ, we are focusing on the miracles rather than on the word of Christ. And that is why we are not influencing the world around us. Because if you read the word well, you, you, re, you realize that Jesus brought a message of transformation. All of us are too busy preparing for rapture that we are not doing what Christ sent us to come and do on this earth. We will be talking about that in the next coming weeks. If you dare to come and listen to me. The church 
has been missing the point for years in many areas, at least many of the uh, parts of the church. Every, every, every organization has a plan to influence society to favor it. Okay, you have the cabals who want to do government to do what will uh, uh, support their business. You have the Muslims who want to change laws to fit their own religion. You have um, uh, the gay people who want laws to be changed to suit their own lifestyle. You have the godless who want God to be removed from everywhere in the school. Every organization, every group of people, they have an agenda to transform society, except the church. Are you feeling me now? Except the church. Yet, Jesus Christ has sent us to transform the society around us. He said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt. Salt is supposed to season. Salt is supposed to change the complexion of the food. But what do we have? We allow the devil to convince us to separate social politics from religion. So we become powerless. They want us to stay in our churches and preach and pray and fast and do night videos and not speak to situations in our environment. So other groups are busy transforming the society we live in. While we as Christians, we are here. I mean, where was the church when they were planning to remove prayer in schools? I'm asking churches in America. Where were you, people? You were busy doing Bible study. When guys were in the, in the, in the, in the, in the National Assembly, in Congress, changing the laws to make it illegal for your child to pray. Where were you when they were passing the laws legalizing gay marriage? And you know what your Bible said about that. Where were you? We are not part of that. We stay in our pulpit and talk. We don't sponsor anybody to go run for elective office. Even if some of us want to run, we are the first to try to pull them down. That is the problem. We focus too much on the miracle. Let me not get distracted. I'm getting a little bit heated up here. Now, miracles are okay, but that is the exception rather than the rule. I know, I know, I know. As you are watching me now, you are already fighting. Those of you believe in this, so I'm going to focus on this on the on the on the screen a lot now and, and, and face it directly. Okay, miracle is the exception to the rule. That is not why you became a Christian. That is not why Christ wants you to become a Christian. And your personal experience should show you that there's something you're missing if you are focusing on miracle. I know, yeah, I know churches. Uh, 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 grow bigger when their pastors start doing miracles. That's why some of them, even in desperation, they start faking miracles. I'm not saying all of them are, but we've seen enough. And if you guys have ever watched um, um, uh, this pastor from Ukraine, you see him actually demonstrate how some pastors actually fake miracles. I'm not about that, but I do know it happens. In desperation, they fake miracles because they believe that is what will make churches grow. But that is not the preference of Jesus. And that is not what he called you to come and do. Because look at your own experience. If really, really, really Jesus, a, a God, wants to be doing miracle all the time, ask yourself, honestly now, honestly, honestly, you've gone to so many miracle nights, vigil nights, anointing services, Holy Ghost night, all that. Ask yourself, quite honestly, how many people do you personally know? I'm talking about you as yourself. Personally know that was blind before you ever went to that um, a miracle service and that got their eyes. Or that were, that, were, that were, I'm not talking about the fake ones. I'm talking about the one that you know before you ever, they ever presented him in church. Ask yourself in your personal circle. That's number one. If you gather one million people together to pray for miracles, Let's even say that genuine ones. You will only find a thousand who will give testimonies of real miracle. I'm not talking about somebody saying something up inside of me. I'm talking about a miracle that is visible, that people can confirm that this guy had this problem for five years. I know him. And he has been cured at this event. If you gather one million people, maybe you get a thousand. So if only a thousand, if your pastor is that good and he can command God, and it commands God, only 1,000 out of 1 million receive miracle. Don't you think you are missing something? Do you want to leave your chance 
to less than 1% of 1% instead of doing what you can for yourself. That's what I'm trying to say. Instead of you using the Holy Spirit that you have to work hard to take your own destiny in your hands as opposed to just expecting the move of God on, 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 on the night. Now, I'm not saying there are no miracles. I'm not saying don't expect miracles. But I'm saying you cannot wait for 30, 38 years by the pool of Bethesda waiting for the pool of the water, for waiting for the anointing to fall on you so that you can become rich, so that you can get a job, so that you can become married. When there are so many things you can do in the meantime, that's all I'm saying. There are some situations where you have done your best, there's nothing else you can do again, except God comes through. I get that. But 99% of us, there's so many things we can still be doing that we're not doing. And we're relying on that night vigil. We're relying on that anointing service. We're relying on that Holy Ghost service. But how many of them have you gone? You need to start thinking, people. Who has bewitched you? You need to start thinking. If this thing is guaranteed to give you the miracle you want, how come you have gone for 20 of them and you are not yet gotten the miracle you wanted? That means there's something you're missing. The preference of God is for you to walk in his word. For you to put the word in your life, to put the word in your body, and to start acting it out. The preference of Jesus is not to come and do miracle and change laws of nature for you. As long as the earth remains, see time and others shall never cease. Whatever my man swear, that he shall reap. That is the law of nature that God put into creation. Every time he does a miracle that is not really necessary is violating is basically changing nature for you and it doesn't do that at uh, 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 um, all the time experience show that i've passed on two churches okay i've gone to many revival nights i've gone to many night vigils i've gone to many holy ghost services. i've gone to many anointing services i can count on my thing five fingers how many real miracles i actually experienced I'm being very honest. I know you some of you won't like to, to hear this. People that I know that had major problems, and I'm talking about physically observable problems, who now got cured at a miracle night or whatever, I can count on my five fingers and I will not finish those five fingers. That is in 18 years of being a pastor. What about you? Maybe I don't work in the right circles. How many people have you personally met? Forget what everybody is telling you. I'm talking about you. Every one of us has got at least four or five thousand friends on Facebook. How many of those have actually received a physical healing or manifestation of miracle that you know? Unless you're lying to yourself, they cannot be up to one percent. So that means then, okay, that the remaining ninety-nine percent who keep waiting, they are going to wait for thirty-eight years and nothing is going to happen. Which means you need to take your destiny in your hands. I am not saying miracle night is not good because that's what some of you will take away from here. The pastor who has started attacking, I've not even started yet. Okay, I'm not about that. I'm about you getting the word of God into your into your body. So Christ, when he met this guy, when I show us something here, he said, take up your mat and go. He spoke to his potential. He spoke to the power that had been lying dormant in the man for years. He spoke to the ability that the man already had that he didn't know. And I've seen this happen. I mean, I'm talking in my business as a as a, a, a digital consultant, for instance. I've seen guys do stuff they don't believe they can do. I get somebody who doesn't have any experience, and then I say, "Come and be a protege." I just did it with four guys. Okay, they don't. They told me they like to write a book. I said, "Okay, you are going to write a book for me on cooking. Maybe sometime next year I'll release that book." And I gave them guidelines. In less than a month, all four of them were able to produce. 40 page, 60 page book. That's a guy I have in Kenya. He doesn't have any book to his name. Every time I tell him to do a book, he is still waiting for me to come and train him. He comes to all my training. Come. So one day I called him. Okay, I'm giving you a real life example here. And I said, listen, we are going to write a book on how to monetize WhatsApp. I have not even released the book yet. He's done it almost a month ago. And I said, I'll give you two weeks. This is how we're going to do it. I did not write one line of that book myself. But the boy wrote 60 pages of amazing, amazing ways to monetize WhatsApp. Because I was on him and I made sure he took action. Yeah, it's a guy that for three, four years, he has been saying he wants to write a book. So there's, it's amazing what you can do when you take things into your hand. I myself, let me 
again, we, we're talking about someone that can bless you. So I'm, I, since I'm in business, I'm going to be diverting a bit into business. I also had this challenge. When I wanted to release my first product as a, my first software, I kept waiting on this guru guy who's my friend. I've been following him for years. Somehow I've tied my destiny to him that he's the one that can actually make the miracle happen. Because when I hear people who are, um, so, so when I hear people who have been, um, sorry, I wanted to make sure I have the right uh, clip up here. Okay, I, I was waiting for this guy to be the one that will actually help me make a breakthrough in my digital business. And for a couple of years, I'll follow him, buy all the stuff, but I kept thinking of him as my savior. Then one day, something happened that I did wrong. It was not even his fault, and he decided to fire me from his group. Now I'm alone. I don't have a choice. Then it occurred to me that why can't I go and do this thing myself? I already have all the training that I needed. I already have all the books of this guy. I already have all the training models of this guy. I've been to so many events where this guy is, so I know what to do. And then my wife spoke to me also that why are you dejected because this man fired you from his training program? You are a where well, you have started businesses before. Why are you downcast? I thought my career was over. I thought I was never going to release a software. But guess what? I decided in anger that, okay, I know what to do. And then I took things into my own hands. Less than 30 days later, and I'm not exaggerating, guys. I launched my first software. The name of the software is called Mobimantic. You can verify and we did over four hundred and thirty thousand dollars in five days. Sorry, in thirty days, three three hundred and seventy thousand in five days, four hundred and thirty thousand dollars in thirty days. The same me that I believe for two or three years that I don't have what it takes to create and launch a software. But the minute I stopped blaming others, the minute I picked up my mat, the minute I realized that that guru is not the one that is going to save my life, I have to save myself. I was able to solve my problem in less than thirty days. I don't know about you out there. Jesus is telling you today, you need to pick up your mat. Because Jesus did not help this guy. He spoke to his potential, just like I'm speaking to yours right now, wherever you are watching this. You have the potential to be all you can. I'm not one of those pastors who just say, going to tell you you're going to be rich tomorrow. No, 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 no. If you want to be part of Cyber Embassy, we are going to leave the world. That is where we are going here. I have nothing against miracle nights, but I do know that Jesus never gathered anybody together to say he won't do miracle. Instead, Jesus gathered them together to teach them how they can do miracles themselves. And that thing that you have been thinking is impossible for you. All you need to do is start tomorrow with the little that you have. Same way this cyber embassy that we're talking about, guys. I've been talking about it for two years. For those of you who can check, you see that even the domain, the cyberambassy.org, was registered 2017. Even the Facebook group was created 2017. But I didn't do anything with it because I was waiting for somebody to teach me how to do it. Until recently when I went to train in Nigeria, and God spoke to me. I believe God spoke to me. I'm not one of those guys that will say God spoke when he did this, but I don't know. But I felt in my spirit that Christ is saying, you go model this thing for them. You've been talking about this all online church for a long time. Go model it. Go. Then I will teach you. As you go. I'm not technical, but here we are. My point is, Jesus spoke to the potential in the guy, and I'm speaking to your potential right now. I'm, I, I'm speaking to your potential. If you are out there, there's some things that you have wanted to do in your life, but somehow, somehow, you keep waiting for the move of the waters. You keep waiting for the perfect circumstances. You keep waiting for the right person to be the one to coach you. You keep waiting for the right person to come along. You're going to wait for 38 years. And nothing's going to happen. But Jesus is speaking to you today. Pick up your mat. We're going to talk about what is your mat in a minute. Pick up your mat and go. Because it's all about the potential. Christ has put the potential in you. That's why he spoke to the potential of the man. He didn't bother to be listening to all his excuses or to try to help him to get into the water or to try to organize help for him to get into the water. He said, pick up your man, man, and get out of here. And the man picked up his man and started working. You know, the minute they gave him command. This is the same man that has been in the same spot for 38 years. How far you can go when you start tomorrow on that idea you have? 
will shock you. Because I'm prophesying to your life right now. That's the type of prophecy you need. As you go tomorrow morning, the Lord will surprise you. Because he's just waiting for you to pick up your mat. He has already said it. He wants the best things for you. Many of you watching there, you know all the Bible passages, right? So quote it. I'm not into that. He said, his wish is for you to be prosperous in spirit as well as in body. So he's waiting. But until you do your part, you have not given Jesus permission to do his part. Until you go in the strength that you have, you have not given God the opportunity to do something for you. And the man, okay, picked up his mat and started running. <laughs> I thought that was really, I thought that was it. So, so Jesus told him, pick up your mat. Because we all remember, right? Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He said, truly I say, tell you, whatever you forbid and declare improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already forbidden in heaven. I'm reading the Amplified Version. Okay, you, need to, you, need, you need to understand this. The Amplified Version of Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He said, truly I tell you, whatever you forbid and declare improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit and declare proper and lawful on earth must be what is already permitted in heaven. Essentially, he's saying everything that needed to be done for you is already done in heaven. Now, you need to do it. So, if something is permitted in your life, it's up to you. Because heaven already did this. But that's what Matthew 16, 18 is telling you. God is waiting for each and every one of us to demonstrate his miracle power in our lives by picking up our mat and going. That's where I'm going today. The new year is coming, so this is a word in time for some of you. It's about time you stop lying on that mat for the next 38 years, or the next five years, or the next three years. It's about the time for you to pick up your mat and go. So let's come to observation number nine. Jesus asked him to pick up his mat. But what exactly is the mat for you and I today? That is the key. What is the mat? Because obviously we had him. He said, pick up your mat and go. So the, the question, of course, arises, what is the mat? The mat is basically what has been your comfort zone, people. Whatever has been your comfort zone or something that is making your present bad situation tolerable, something that is making you comfortable in mediocrity. That is your mat. Your comfort zone, something that is making you comfortable. No, to something that is not acceptable to, acceptable to you is around you or in you. But that thing that is making it bearable for you, that's your mat. Some of you, you don't have a job, but you are not motivated to go look for a job because your girlfriend is cooking food for you or your wife is giving you food to eat at home. That's your mat. You need to get off that mat and go. I always tell people, if I don't have a job, if I'm not, if I don't put money on the table, my wife will not give me food to eat. It's not because she hates me, but she doesn't abide fools. Too many of us are the ones, too many of us, husband or wives, we are the ones encouraging our spouses not to, to maximize their potential because we cover them up where we are not supposed to cover them. At least internally, I'm not saying quarrel with your husband or wife outside. But a man that is not putting the food on the table for his wife is worse than an unbeliever. That's what the word said. But you call yourself a pastor. You call yourself a spirit-filled, born-again Christian. You don't put food on the table for your children. You are expecting your wife to be the one putting up the food. You are worse than an unbeliever. That's what the word said, not me. I don't have an opinion. I'm an ambassador. I say, what is the word of my king? What is the word of, my, of where they sent me from? The Bible says, he who does not take care of his family is worse than an unbeliever. So don't tell me how much you love God. Don't tell me how much spirit inside of you. You don't have a job. You can't feed your family. And you're not out there hustling like a monster to make sure that cost is removed from you. Whatever has been your comfort zone. Things that you have been telling people that has made people make you feel comfortable in your mediocrity. What is your mind? It is whatever you have been using as an excuse for not winning. I have a guy that I was trying to help the other day. I gave him an assignment um, on one of these freelancing services. He's a, he's a Nigerian guy. Obviously, I'm also Nigerian, although I live in the U.S. And I wanted to help him because he's been following me around. I said, okay, go create your account on uh, afreelancer.net. 
I will give you uh, a job. That way you can do it. And then you can be earning dollars from me because I pay people all the time for these assignments. Three days later, it was supposed to be delivered in 24 hours. The job is not done. And what is he telling me? Oh, there is no nepa, there is no light. Or my computer doesn't work. I'm like, excuse me? If your computer doesn't work, don't you know to go to business center? If you don't have light in your house, don't you need to get out? Oh, it's a business center is far from where it is. I'm like, you are not ready. And that was the last time I used that person because he's using the excuse of lack of facilities in Nigeria as an excuse for not flowing. Meanwhile, in that same Nigeria, there are guys who are making hundreds of thousands of dollars monthly. I know some of them. I trained some of them. On the, and many of them have never even been abroad. But they use excuses. Some of your excuses, your child. Oh, I can't go back to school now because I have two kids. Who's going to stay at home with my kids? There are people who have four kids and who went to school. Figure out how they do it. That's your math. Your math is whatever you have been using as, as an excuse for not winning. Oh, some of you, oh, I have only one eye. I'm blind. There are blind people who are doing great things. I saw this. I saw this uh, video about this guy that doesn't have two. He doesn't have arm or doesn't have leg. I forgot his name now. He came to Nigeria once. Is amazing. That guy learned to cook for himself. He learned to eat his own food. Meanwhile, he has no arms. His leg is shriveled. And now the guy is speaking to them, motivating them at Harvard. His book is actually called What's Your Excuse? Some of you should Google it. He has a guy without arms, without legs, who is who is being carried around in limousine now. Who is a multi-millionaire because he used the little that he can. You need to stop giving yourself excuses. That's your math. Your country situation is your math. The color of your skin is your mind because I'm black. I'm not, I'm not blind. I know there's discrimination everywhere, but why should I stop you? Then go for where they're they not going to discriminate against you. Do what there's a way you get that even white people, for those of you who like to get into this black, uh, white on black discrimination, I just laugh. I'm an immigrant. You can hear from my accent. But I have a law farm right here in the US. I live in a very nice house. Why are they not discriminating against me? Because I don't even see it. I do what I have to do. I employ white people. I employ blacks. I employ Mexicans. I don't care. If you have a problem against me, I simply move away from you. So I'm not saying there is no discrimination, but why should that stop you? That's a mat. Get off of it. Go look for something to do. For those of us who don't like immigrants, who say, oh, they are coming here to take our job, the white guys, now I'm talking to you. Why should a white guy with an accent be the one taking your job? Shame on you. You should be working. You should get a job. You should be employing him. You can't use him as an excuse. He came from Africa. He came from Mexico. So the man is coming, fighting for his own soul, fighting for his own family. So if he can come into your country and make it, and you are not making it, then stop looking at him. Now, again, like I said, I don't separate politics from, from religion. It's all the same. So I see some, some guys out there, they hate immigrants for so that they want to kill themselves over it. Now, I'm not getting into the policies about immigration or no immigration. You want to go to somebody's country, you should go there legally. So I'm with Trump on that one. But I'm talking about the, those guys who think immigrants are their problem. If an immigrant like me can come here, start a law firm. I started from zero, from $7 an hour job too. That's not all the degrees I had. I tried to get a Burger King job for six weeks. I could not even get one. Then I had to go work in telemarketing. Seven day I was making phone call to people. I started from there, then gradually saved money, then sat for the bar, then here I am. If I can come here, people can come from Mexico with nothing. And then they end up buying houses. They end up buying cars. And you don't have any. You don't even have a job. And you think it's them you want to blame? Shame on you. You need to get off your back and you need to start working. For me, once all of us get into individual responsibility, we are going to get to where we need to be. What are you waiting for? Because nobody's coming to help you. They're lying to you. Whoever says wants to help you, wants to take from you. That's how it is. Even the Bible is clear. To those who have more will be given. Those who don't even have more, the little they have will be taken away from them and be given to the rich guy. I don't know why people complain that rich get richer. It's in the Bible. They will get richer. And the poor will get poorer. I didn't write the word. It's right there in the Bible. You want to make sure you are not part of the poorer guy. You want to break that poverty. 
by getting off your mat and making sure you're part of the rich people. I don't apologize for the word of God. It's Jesus that said it, not me. The rich will get richer, and those the poor, even the little they have, will be taken away from them because they are not maximizing it. So you need to get off your mat instead of waiting for them to tax the, the, the rich people to death so that they can give you money when you are sitting on your couch watching football when you're supposed to be working. You need to get it out there and start working, guys. So bottom line, you can sit on that mat waiting for people or you can take your destiny in your own hands and go now. Before I close, let me take some um, some comments from you guys. You guys have some of you have been commenting as I get into 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 this, and I don't want it to be like I'm ignoring you. All right, everything is that God bless, Pastor. Oh, I'm truly blessed by the raw word of Christ. Yes, uh, Alex Maldona says, if you want a miracle, you'll be laying lame for 38 years or more, like this man. Thank you. That's a fact. Okay. All right. So, um. More, 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 more. Bring your comments, guys. I want to hear you on this before I close this today. Let's have a discussion. The summons are no longer where a pastor sits on the pulpit or the cybertorium, as we call this, and start throwing it down. We have to have an exchange. Okay, you exchange with me, I exchange with you. I've said my piece. Okay, so let me hear from you before we close today. This is the only model of, of summon. This is the point where I tell you to raise up your hand and the Holy Spirit uh, will descend stuff on you. No, let me hear from you first before we pray. What do you think about this summon? You, you got to have an opinion. If you disagree with me, say so. Let's have a discussion because there's, there's, there's too little discussion in the body of Christ about things that matter to them. We come in, somebody throws it down for us, and then we take it as the as the God's gospel. We don't even think for ourselves in most, in most, in most times. All right? Uh, Alex says, and uh, indicator of a leader is they say the box stops here. I am responsible. Thank you. You can't be a leader. If you don't take responsibility, and that's what this is. If it is going to be, it's going to be up to you. Okay, you are the leader that you have been waiting for. That is that is the bottom line here. You are the leader that you have been waiting for. All right. Yes, uh, Pastor Chooks. Even though he, he, he said he said you have lied there for too long on that spot, the word says rise up and walk. It is time to make a move. Thank you. I didn't, uh, that's on a private chat, so I can't put that on the screen here. But guys, you need to be thinking today, what are you waiting for? There's nothing to, everything you need to make a move is right in you. Particularly if you have the Holy Spirit. Of course, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you can't even know where we're going. That is why you need to recognize Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, who will teach you the way unto salvation. You can't even do it by yourself. The word will not even make sense to you if you don't have the Holy Spirit. So that's where you need to be going. I'm going to invite one of our, our speakers in a minute um, to do the closing prayer. But my point to you is that stop waiting. Creation waits for the manifestation of the children of God. This is the way we are going. This Romans chapter 8 verse 9. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. What that means is that lots of people are waiting for you to manifest your greatness. There's somebody waiting for that job that you are about to create. There's somebody who's about to be blessed with the work of your hands. Creation waits for the eager revelation of the children of God. Creation waits in expectation for the manifestation of the children of light. That's another translation. Romans 8.19, that's such a powerful, powerful verse. In the sense that so many things in creation is waiting for you to do your part. And yet you are waiting. The longer you wait, the longer you, de you, you, you delay the other person that is supposed to flow from this. That's why I also decided that the time has come to start Cyber Embassy. Because there are many pastors all over the world who are waiting to be able to know how to do this. They want to do it. The training I did in Nigeria recently showed me that lots of pastors are interested in taking their gospels online. But they don't know how. So for as long as I keep waiting for somebody else to do it, for as long as I keep thinking, keep talking about it, I'm holding the revelation of those pastors. Because some of them have the word in them. Some of them have missions to different places of the world. As long as I am waiting, instead of going to figure out how to do an all online church, then teaching them so that they can manifest, I am slowing down the work of God. And there is judgment for that. Same way with you. 
what are you slowing down right now? That great business idea you have that I've been talking about for years. Creation is waiting for you to manifest. Because when you manifest, other people, imagine how many of us are benefiting from Facebook manifesting. Imagine if the guy that God gave the idea of Facebook never did it. We won't be here. Creation waits for the manifestation of the children of God. Somebody somewhere is waiting for you to manifest. Stop waiting. Start doing. And as you hear the word today, I believe the Lord himself will speak to you. I believe that it will, man it will magnify the word even where I've messed it up, where I've not been clear. The Holy Spirit will clarify it for you. Where I have put myself in the sermon to, to, uh, to distract you, the Holy Spirit will remove it and teach you yourself. You need to move. What are you waiting for? 2020 should be a year of taking possessions for you. It should be a year when you are going rather than waiting. Father, I thank you for the word today. Father, as I've, as I've spoken the word, Father, let it become life in the life in the lives of those who have had me today. Let it minister to them. Let it become part of them. Let this word that they have had today, let it contend with them. As long as they continue to sit on that mat of comfort, let the word contend with them. Let it worry them so that they can get off their mat and start manifesting in different areas. Those who need to manifest in society, those who need to manifest in social life, those who need to manifest in business, those who need to manifest in your kingdom work. Father, let them begin to manifest from today so that they will pick up their mat and go in the mighty name of Jesus. That's it, guys. Thank you so much much uh, for listening like we're about to wrap up uh, the, the service uh, this test service again this is a uh, a test service for uh, how we're going to be running our services hope you are blessed I want to hear your comments uh, on this please I want to hear your comments on the on the test service today uh, what we can do better uh, and all that stuff and let the conversation continue to go again sermons are supposed to be discussed let's have discussion on the Facebook page I will continue to monitor this page for your comments on the on the sermon, and we can continue to sharpen each other. Okay, I don't claim to know the whole world. I don't claim to be the expert out there. I'm just doing the best I can as God gives me utterance. So iron sharpens iron. Let's have constructive discussion about this and how we can all help ourselves uh, to go. If you are blessed by this uh, by this uh, sermon, I want you to like the page. I want you to share the uh, the link of the of the sermon with your friends who you think can benefit from this, and above all, we want you to join us uh, for the uh, to be one of the pioneer members of the um, Saba Embassy of Christ. And uh, you can go at the sabaembassy.org slash pioneers or the sabaembassy.org. Both of them will leave you there. Uh, join us and help us uh, uh, spread uh, the word. And if you are blessed by this, like I said, you want to share this uh, link with your friends. On Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, Instagram, we have a Facebook page. Okay, where we also broadcast live into that is the uh, the Church Cybertorium. You want to join that uh, on Facebook group. Okay, there is a Facebook group, the Cyber Embassy Main Church. If you are watching this, you want to join us there, and you also want to like our page, uh, where we also broadcast to and help us uh, to bring this work of God into light. We appreciate you guys so much. Today, we are not going to be doing uh, the offering or any of that. Uh, this is a test broadcast, but hopefully, as we get it together, uh, we can perfect the work. Join us on the 1st of January when we have our first official uh, full service. It's still pre uh, inauguration. We're going to be inaugurated officially February 2nd, 2020. That is the first Sunday in February. But until then, we are going to have our regular services on Sundays and on Wednesdays. Hopefully, you can join us and you want to share this link with at least 10 or 20 of your friends. Let them join us. Let us bring the word of God to the internet so that the word of God can rule, so that the spirit of God can rule on this internet. Three billion people every day. We can't let other people be teaching them what to believe. We got to bring the word in every area, not just in evangelism, but in discipleship, in ministry, in fellowship, everything on the internet so that the Great Commission can keep marching on. I love you guys. I bless you so much. And I, I, I pray that the Lord himself will reveal himself to you this year. 
that great things will begin to happen as a result of you listening to this today. And as you get testimonies of things happening, as you begin to get off your mat, please share it with us. If you are blessed by this testimony and something happened to you or you did something with it, please share those testimonies with us so that you can encourage others. There's a reason you share testimony so that others can be encouraged. We are all about you internalizing the word of Christ. And the Lord bless you. Real good. This is Pastor O from the Cyber Embassy of Christ for All Nations. And I look forward to seeing you on the 1st of January for our very first official broadcast. I can't wait.